Thank you for tuning in to the Hope, Strength, Courage podcast. Love and support for parents whose kids are fighting for their lives. A weekly podcast created to support parents and caregivers of children diagnosed with cancer, where you will find resources collected to help you face each day with hope, strength, and courage. From interviews with the top experts in their fields, doctors, psychologists, chaplains, and inspiring frontline workers in pediatric oncology as they share their best advice, as well as day-to-day advice collected from other cancer moms and leaders in personal growth and development. From individuals who understand how hard it can be, I hope you will feel better prepared to cope with the day-to-day challenges of caring for your child. Hi, I am Laura Lane, and I am your host. My own daughter, Celeste, was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 12. In 2015, I wrote about our experiences in the book, Two Mothers, One Prayer, Facing Your Child's Cancer with Hope, Strength, and Courage. Since that time, I have dedicated thousands of hours to share with other parents and caregivers the resources, tools, tips, and skills and strategies I learned that helped our family stay happier, healthier, and more hopeful. My goal is to share with you my interviews with experts to support you as you care for a child with cancer. Today's episode features my interview with highly sought after business consultant, speaker, and coach, Kevin Hall. Kevin is one of my mentors, and he generously wrote the foreword to my book, Two Mothers, One Prayer, Facing Your Child's Cancer with Hope, Strength, and Courage. In this episode, Kevin shares with us words that strengthen us as we support our families. I hope you will enjoy Kevin's stories and wisdom in this interview as much as I did. I am pleased to formally introduce you to Kevin Hall. Kevin is a highly sought after business consultant, speaker, coach, uh, and author on the subjects of sales, goal achievement, and living a life of purpose and intention. His international best-selling book, Aspire, Discovering Your Purpose Through the Power of Words, is the highest rated personal development book in the history of Amazon and Barnes & Noble. He has been recognized for his groundbreaking groundbreaking approach to uncovering the hidden and often secret meanings of words. Kevin is also credited with wordsmithing and trademarking the original slogan for the 2002 Olympic Winter Games, Ignite the Fire Within. He has been featured in Forbes magazine, Worth magazine, Nations, Restaurant News, Restaurant Business, and on the Food Network. Kevin and his wife, Sherry, are proud parents of six children. He enjoys cycling, running, fly fishing, cooking, and reading. Thanks, Laura. Um, So tell us what led you on the path to becoming a wordsmith. You know, I took a test. I went to the Johnson O'Connor Research Foundation. They did a test. They have eight testing centers across the United States. And they told me after a day and a half of testing, that I wasn't an engineer, that I shouldn't build tall buildings or expansive bridges, they would collapse. They tested me for tweezer dexterity. I I did my very best, and they said out of the hundreds of thousands, nearly a million people that they tested, I was in the bottom one-tenth of one one one-hundredth of one percent, which means I don't have tweezer dexterity. So if I was your brain (laughs) surgeon, good things aren't going to happen. But then they gave me a test. They gave me a piece of paper. They gave me a piece of paper like this, and they wrote a word on it. And they said, write as much as you can write. This was a three-minute test. And I filled up that side, filled up the other side of the page. They brought me another paper, four, five, and a half papers later. They said, of all the people who we've tested, you tested out at the very top for a thing called idea for it. It was the ability to create words and thoughts around a single word. And then that they said, you'll never be fulfilled. You can you should write, you should or you should speak, you should market, sell. I had done that most of my career at Franklin and other areas, but they said you'll never be happy until you write. And then I hid from that <coughs> what I call a calling. It's a calling, not a shouting. It will call at you until you do it. You know, having done your book, you know how hard that is to get that out because when you write a book, then people tell you if they like it or not. So that's why most writers write, but they don't have it written. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did. I jumped into that book, and it's changed my life. <coughs> it's an incredible book. I love 
the paragraph from the description of your keynote presentations, and I'm going to read it. You will discover and understand that words contain intrinsic power, a force capable of lighting one's path and hope for horizons. Used correctly, words are the first building blocks for success and inner peace. They provide the vision and focus and show the way to growth and contribution. Used incorrectly, they are capable of undermining even the best of intentions. There is a language of success and language of distress. There is a language of progress and a language of regress. Words sell and words repel. Words lead and words impede. Words heal and words kill. What is it that makes words so powerful? Well, you've heard me say this as we've worked together. You know, every thought you think and every word you speak, it creates your future. If you, if you act on what you think and what you say, and we usually do. So just think of that. Every thought that I think, as a man thinketh, as a woman thinketh, so is he or she. Every, and then when we express that word, it really becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I say, oh, I'm so busy, there's not enough time, I wish I weren't so busy, well, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Maybe in the future you won't be busy. Maybe people don't want your services. Maybe, you, you know, be careful what you ask for, you might get it. But if you say instead, oh, I'm blessed, right? Barb Dock taught me that. If we say, I'm blessed, Instead of I'm busy, it takes a totally different shift. If we say I'm coming from a place of abundance versus a place of scarcity, I want to focus on love and not on fear. Well, we, it's a total shift of what happens in our life mm -hmm. when we focus on those things that we really want, not on what we don't want. Yeah. Well, I know that you know from experience how to live that. Um, one of the reasons I asked you to write the foreword for my book is because your own daughter was diagnosed with a benign brain tumor in 2011, which is the same year that Celeste was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you and your wife? And how did you cope with that devastating news at that time? And what did you do to remain positive and help your daughter and your family remain positive? Well, that, you know, when I think of your daughter and then I think of our daughter, and um, it's such an individual situation, but it was like you had the one, right? The wind knocked literally out of your cells. We were coming from Deer Valley to uh, watch our two granddaughters in their final soccer game. It was picture day for that year. We're coming down, and then we get a call that our daughters had a had a brain seizure, and she was just getting ready to turn on the key to drive her kids and a couple of our kids to this game. Luckily, she hadn't started the car, and later that night, the doctor comes in and she says, Summer, that's our oldest daughter's name, you have two brain tumors, and they're in the center of your speed center. They didn't know they were benign then, but it was going to be difficult to get them out because she might never be able to formulate a thought or utter a word again if they, if they caused any damage there. And so when the doctor said that, one was the size of a grape, one was the size of a large pea, there was real cause uh, for concern. Her husband was out of town, so I slept in the hospital that night. So anyone that's gone through this, you, others, I have a new sense of understanding to a degree because we were fortunate the way things turned out, but a new uh, sense of empathy um, and then I went into dad mode and protector mode. And uh, once we were able to schedule the surgery, we had the best you know, care that you could ever get at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. They're amazing what they do there. But when people came in to visit our daughter, and I would say this for anyone in your community, Laura, that it's important that they're positive, they're upbeat, because sometimes they're emotional and they want to share all of their concerns. And you've heard me say this, we would meet people at the door. We'd pull somebody at the door and say, are you coming to see Summer Day? Yes. Are you in a good frame of mind? Can you be positive? Can you be upbeat? And if they weren't, we would say it's probably not the right day to see Summer, because you can't have a negative thought and a positive thought in your mind at the same time. And we wanted 
positivity. You know, it's it, it's real, and you're you're going through something devastating, so you can't add to that. And so we were fortunate that when people came in to visit our daughter, they didn't come to share problems, concerns, break down in tears. They came to affirm her, to encourage her, you know, to encourage us to add to somebody's heart, core, so you are heart. So we said, when you breathe life into her, or will you add to her heart when you come in? And uh, I think that went a long ways mm-hmm. for her being able to recover. And also, you know, having just returned from Vienna, I spent some time with Victor Frankl and his family, the Men's Search for Meaning author. Um, it was important that she knew that her family loved her and that there was something for her to look forward to. And she said, you know, when they cut your skull open, no matter how much pain medication they give you, they can't relieve the swelling. I mean, you've been through this, you can't relieve that. But for her to hold her little son, Miles, I was just with him two days ago. He's now seven, he would have been you know, three years old then. Mm-hmm. And she said that she could just hold Miles and that gave her a reason to go on. It gave her, her pain on a scale of one to 10 was about a nine and a half. If that was near death, she just would hold miles and it would help her get through. Um, I will tell you this, one of the most poignant things I've ever experienced, um, the day before that surgery, um, you know, the family gathered, uh, we had prayers, blessings, expressed our words to each other, and then we went to the hospital and you wait, right? You wait and wait and wait. That wait, um, that wait. That wait, and you all know, they just you can't change that wait. We came back to her home that night, and they, obviously she was in the hospital for a long time to recover, but she'd written a note to each of her three children, just in case she couldn't utter another, just in case they, 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 they hit the speed center and something went awry. And uh, she wanted them to know what their gifts were. She wanted them to know how much she loved them. She wasn't saying, I'm not going to be able to speak to you anymore. But that was that was life-changing for me, to see a loving mother, as you are, with your daughter and your son, um, you know, everything that you go through. And, uh, um, you know, sometimes your prayers get answered, and sometimes they get answered in a different way. Um, just the courage to go through that. So, yeah, we do share. I haven't been down that exact same path as you have, but uh, I'll never be the same, you know, having witnessed her. But I'm grateful for the care, what's out there now. And, uh, you know, I lost my mother to cancer. And in some ways, as difficult as cancer is, it can be very loving. It's You say, well, how can cancer be loving? But my mother gave us a chance to say goodbye, right? It gave us a chance to say the things that we had maybe left unsaid. Yeah. It wasn't like just this heart attack and she was gone and she died way too young, but I was able um, to have her live at her home before hospice came in and just let her know how much we loved her. Yeah, that's wonderful. What words do you suggest to parents that they should focus on or, um, or avoid while they are supporting their child through their diagnosis? Boy, that's a good question. Like what word or words, right? Well, I know as a friend, you know this, as a friend or a family member, what you don't want to say is, how can I help, right? Mm -hmm. How how can I help? Because you're in the middle of everything. You just help. You just show up and you do. So. I'll share a couple of words that bring that to mind, passion. Those with passion do, those without passion try. Passion comes from Christianity. It came from the 12th century. It means I'm willing. People say, well, passion is love. Yeah, that's part of it. But passion means I'm willing to suffer for what I love. If I were to go back to Vienna in April, in Europe, anywhere, they have a reenactment of one who suffered for what he loved. They call it a passion play. So whether it's Christianity, Judaism, Victor Frankl said, what is to give light must endure burning. If you're going to give off light, there's going to be a little bit of burning. So I would understand passion. Passion says, okay, yeah, we're going to suffer for what 
we love here. We love this job. We love what we're going through. Um, it doesn't help to say why me, right? It doesn't help to say, well, how could this happen? Good things, bad things happen to good people all the time. And so you need to come back and say, what matters most? Let me pa- let me have passion. Sapere videre, knowing how to see. That was Da Vinci's term, sapere, S-A-P-E-R-E, videre. Sapere, knowing. Videre, see. I know how to see. He could see things three, four, five hundred years ahead of time. Mm-hmm. And in studying Victor Frankl's life, I'm working on a legacy project um, about his life. He felt that those that survived the death camps, he was prisoner 119, 105, 104, excuse me, and he was in four different death camps. And he was very lucky to to come out of a death camp only one in 26 ever survived. Um, But he attributed that to being forward thinking, to saying, what can I look forward to? So the other thing for parents is what's ahead, right? Create positive things ahead for you in your life, just like you've done, you know, with your speaking career, your writing career, you've done some remarkable things as a result of what's happened. And I think of Victor's words, everything he meant a man or a woman, everything be taken from a man, but the last of the human freedoms, the ability to choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances, the ability to choose one's own way. So probably the biggest work, and you know what it is, because you're part of our our global greats, it's Genshai. G-E-N-S-H-A-I. And that word is like the Western word charity, but maybe even a little deeper, if there could be anything deeper than charity. It comes from India, it comes from their sacred red, and it means you would never treat another person in a manner that would make them feel small. You don't do it to somebody else. You don't let somebody do it to you. And above all, you don't do it to yourself. So that's that's something that I would focus on is um, practicing Genshai that you're because you don't see the world as it is. You see the world as you see yourself. And. I use affirmations, right? Our mind isn't here to make us happy or healthy or wealthy. It's here to keep us alive and to avoid things that are painful. So that's why we use those affirmations. And you know, you know the five, you know the five affirmations okay. that I share when I'm coaching somebody or group coach. I'm not going to put you on the spot. Oh, okay, but, thank you. <laughs> I'm like, I do know so, them. I'd have to take a minute to think of them through. Yeah, you know them, but I'll just share them. You get a negative thought. And you say, I'm worthy, right? I'm worthy. I'm, I'm, I'm worthy of achieving the things I want to achieve. I'm capable and grateful. Gratitude. That's a huge word going through this. Just be grateful for those that come and visit, those that provide the health care. Grateful that we have the technology that we have. Grateful for the time, however long and short it might be with our loved one. I'm capable and grateful. Gratitude comes from grace, and grace means divine gift. So... Express your gifts. Serve others with your gifts. We love those we serve. So when you start serving the pain, it doesn't totally go away, but it, uh, it's, it's, it's painfully sweet. I forgive. I forgive who? Myself and others. I forgive myself and I forgive what's happening here. So you can use the past as a hitching post or you can use it as a guidepost. I'd rather use it as a guidepost and not relive those painful things. And then to say, I'm abundant. Abundance is our birthright. What comes after one wave? Laura, what comes after one wave when you're sitting in the ocean? Another one, and another one. And another one, and another one. Attesting to the fact nature gives all and loses nothing. Mm -hmm. And then my favorite is I trust myself. I'm trusting. I trust that whatever mutually beneficial goal that I go after, that I'm capable of achieving it. And if I don't do it, somebody's going to, so why not me? So I use those in other affirmations. If I get, you know, people say, do you ever get a negative thought? Of course I do. We all do. Nobody's immune from that. But that's why we need to reprogram our minds. And we do it with words and get very intentional about those. And one other thing would be intention. The word intention comes from tent. Think of the middle of a tent. You, you take out a tent, a piece of fabric, and you stake it. You claim your ground, and you stretch it, and then you put it up, and it becomes much bigger. So you get very intentional 
about what you want in your life, who you want in your life, who you can serve, who you can love. So we, we could do a hundred words, but passion, vision, superior videre. Um, you know, Victor said, when I'm going through a lot of pain, which he, he obviously knew a lot about, um, being at Dachau, Auschwitz, at Terrazon, but before we're thinking, what work is out there? Who can I serve? Who can I love? That kept him going, and it kept him alive. When when you were uh, mentioning the um, the the five, and you said forgiveness, I know that for myself, something I only just learned this week about forgiveness that there are times when people, it's not just people have done things to us. But sometimes people fail to be there for us, and we need to forgive that too. That we may have expectations about what we want people to do, how we want them to help us through difficult times, and they're not there for us. And, and that was really important for me to learn that, no, I needed to forgive those people who didn't step up like I wanted them to, because people will, sometimes they don't know how. Um, that. That, that forgiveness, I think that was an extra part of forgiveness that I had forgotten about. That Ooh, thanks. thanks for sharing that, because it is, forgiveness is a gift that you give to yourself. Yeah. So if you're to hold on to a grudge or hold on to an expectation that was unmet, the only person that's going to suffer from that is yourself. Is it. It's us. It would be ourselves. So when we let that go, Remember at our Genshai event, when we sang around the fire, we put out something we wrote down that we've been holding on to to let it go, and then we just sang, you yeah. know, that prose song, yeah. right? I'm sure you're going to be interviewing Nathan Ogden, and, and he'll share some of his thoughts about be, being unfrozen. But yeah, we do need to let it go. And it's a gift that you give to yourself. It doesn't mean that the behavior or what happened was right. It doesn't make that right. It's just that you choose not to hold on to it again. It's using your past as a guidepost versus a hitching post. Because you can hitch up to it. We want to be right. We want to show, well, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. Well, then I didn't forget. Hey, I'll never forget what you did. You let me down. You didn't. And to take the other side of that, Laura, I, I will say sometimes, and it's not mine. It's been out there from several different sources. But what other people think of you is none of your business, right? What people think of you we can't control what other people think of us. So maybe that person can't quite control what you were thinking about them or what the expectation was. And to let that go is so, so free. Yeah. And it's something we're going to do for the rest of our life. It's part of a relationship. It's part of being in, in a civilized society when we interact with people. And just let it go. And it's very freeing to let go of maybe what people's expectations are for you, right? If somebody... Um, isn't happy with you and maybe you haven't done a thing. Well, what they think of you, it's none of your business. You just let it go and you go focus on what you need to do. And that's a way of letting those things go. Um, like Mandino wrote that we sometimes create prisons around ourselves. We build them up stone by stone, block by block. And one of the best ways and the worst ways to do that is to hold on to things. They just, they hurt our heart, they pain our heart, they take us off path. You can't walk your path. Again, if you're focusing on something negative when you could be focusing on something positive. It's one or the other. Yeah. So good for you. Thank you. For letting Thanks. that go. And that can be very painful and hurtful when people let us down and they're not there. But to let that go is, is going to serve you much better. So, And you are a very forgiving, very kind person. That's why I'm honored to be on this call because you're making a difference in people's lives, Laura. And I just congratulate you. And I'm honored to know you and to see you serve people. I was honored to write forward to your book and, and just see all the great things that you're doing. You can you can choose, as Victor taught, your attitude. Mm -hmm. And you've done that. And and we don't always do that, but you, you've made conscious, intentional choices and uh, and here you are, making a difference to people in a community that really need that. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, and and I appreciate all the things that you've taught me, and I would like to share you with our audience, and if you could sh let us know what website 
we can direct the audience to so they can learn about you, about your work, about your book, where they can order your book? Where would be the best place for them to go? Well, you should be able to get my book, hopefully, in Amazon, you know, go to Amazon, you go to Barnes & Noble. If your local bookstore doesn't have it, tell them to carry it, and they'll get it in for you. Um, you can get me on, on social media, and I'm getting back on there. It got so intense, I kind of stepped away, but you can go to Kevin Hall Like, that's my like page, or Kevin Hall Aspire okay. is my personal page, hence the name of my book. At Facebook, you can contact me there, and then um, powerboards.com. I'm um, if, if you want to reach out to me, go to powerboards.com. You can go in there. You can email me, Kevin, at powerboards.com. And if there's anything that I could do to serve any of you, it would be my my great pleasure. And I want to finish just one thought, if I can. Perfect. Because you, you really remind me of this. I was just with a friend um, Sunday. I had a dear friend who um, was coming to go mountain biking. We were visiting a granddaughter, and he crashed on his mountain bike. I would have been with him on that bike ride, and he's now a quadriplegic and very serious, a little more serious. If, if there could be anything more serious than what Nathan Ogden or Chad Hymas have, he's, he's on a respirator, and he broke you know, his second vertebrae. They call it the Christopher Reeves injury. And you know what happened to Superman. He wasn't Superman after he fell off of that horse and landed just wrong. Well, that happened to Dana. And we, his name is Dana Harrison. We biked thousands of miles together. One of my best friends. One of my best friends in the whole world. And we spent three hours together. Sunday we watched the final stage of the Tour de France. And we laughed. And he's been able to control his breathing. He speaks by exhaling. And he talked for almost three hours. We just, it was remarkable. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just want to share a paraphrase again, having been in Vienna the last several weeks. I just got home Sunday night. Um, he said this, and I'm paraphrasing his words, but when you're no longer able to change the situation, you're then challenged to change yourself. And, and you know those words because you've lived them. Dana knows those words because he's living them. We all, to some degree, are going to have challenges. Not, I don't think, you know, to, they're all different. They're all personal. But you can't compare, right? You can't compare your challenge with somebody else's. I, you can't start trading them. But there's a point sometimes we say, well, how can this just happen to me? I, I was doing a coaching call with a private client of mine earlier, and, he said, I hate that this is the case, and I hate that this is here. And I said, you know, it just is. What is, it is. And you can't change what is. The only thing you can change is yourself. And I want to just, again, congratulate you. You've got so much ahead, Laura. You're going to be making, you are making a difference in so many lives. And if there's any way you need me again, I'll be here. If there's anything I can do for anybody in your community, that would be my great pleasure because my dream is to help people realize their dreams. My goal is to help people realize their goals. And that's what gets me out of bed every morning. Well, thank you. And then being able to know people like you that, that go out and serve and make a difference and make the most. Um, you know, you can take this adversity and you can say, okay, what's happened to me? It's I'm, I'm in a pit. Here, here I was and now... I've just been knocked down. The whole world's falling around me. You can look at it that way, and that's very understandable. Or you can say, I'm going to harness this adversity, and it's going to become a new launching path. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to be standing on higher ground because of my attitude. So I just congratulate you for doing that, and I hope that maybe today I was just sharing one thought or idea or principle that can help someone. And again, if I can help you in any way, well, learn those how to hold of me. I'm going to do, I'd love to finish this off with a quote from your book, which is my favorite right. quote, and it ties in with what you were just saying a moment ago about adversity. Um, and it's, it's a quote that you put in your book from um, Dave Blanchard um, from the Ogmandina Group, and he says, Our character has been forged in the furnace of adversity. We know what pain feels like. We cannot change the past. However, we can choose to use these reference points as a rich resource 
to assist us in better understanding and connecting with people. When we use our life experiences in the service of others, we finally find purpose in our suffering, joy in our journey, and much needed healing in our souls. And I am so grateful that you included that quote in your book. I have used it countless times, shared that with people, and it helped me to realize that no, we can find purpose in our suffering and joy in our journey and healing in our own souls um, for the things that we experience that when we help others um, because of the things that we've been through, it makes a huge difference. And thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Laura. I think the world of you, it's uh, just exciting to watch you go out and make a difference. And again, anything I can do for you or anybody in your community, you let me know and it'll be done. So thank you for taking the time today. Thank you. What impressed me most about my interview with Kevin is his brilliant storytelling and wisdom that he shares throughout the interview. I could listen to Kevin for hours. In fact, I have listened to Kevin for hours as he mentored me over for a number of years. I'm grateful that he talked about passion and our willingness to suffer for what we love. And just like Dr. Seaton in our previous episode, he talks about Viktor Frankl and most importantly, Genshai. Never treat another person in a manner that would make them feel small. To learn more about Kevin and his book, Aspire, please visit his website at powerofwords.com. Please join me next week for part one of my interview with NLP practitioners, Jackie Nagy and Ed Olvera, as we discuss, discuss how to use NLP and breathing to manage daily stress. Before we end our show today, we have one last segment. Over the last few years, I have asked other cancer moms what advice they wish they had known when their child was first diagnosed. I compiled that information and will be sharing their advice each week. When you, you can download the top 101 piece of advice that I put together as a mini ebook at twomothersoneprayer.com. Today's advice comes from Tammy. Tammy writes, ask for help and don't be shy and get a family member or friend to coordinate. People will often happily drop off meals or grocery shop for you. And tell people that while you appreciate that they care, you will not necessarily be responding personally because you are exhausted and focused on taking care of your kid and family. That's great advice, Tammy. Setting boundaries while accepting help. Thanks for sharing that. If you have advice you have learned along the way that you wish someone had told you weeks, months, or years earlier, I invite you to fill out the contact form on our website, twomothersoneprayer.com. I will be sharing your advice with our listeners on future shows. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule today to listen to the Hope, Strength, Courage podcast. I look forward to sharing more experts and advice with you again next Wednesday. Please remember to take a minute to, dis- to subscribe to the show. Thanks also need to go out to our Hope, Strength, Courage production team which consists of my wonderful assistant, Tracy Ogilvy McDonald, Andrew Braun at Braun Audio and Audio Geek, music by Chris Anthony, social media support by Marie Faye Constantino, and graphic design by Amy Hosmer. To learn more about myself, Laura Lane, and to order my book, please visit lauralane.ca.